Hi, I'm Jonathan Weinberg again. Um, it's another one of those really cold days, so I'm stuck, stuck inside. Uh, and it ain't a quick night out, one man open. And I thought I would talk today about one of my favorite artists who's nowhere as famous as uh, Rembrandt. I mean, maybe you may have never even heard of him. He is the picture book artist and illustrator and painter, um, Edward Ardizzoni. A, a word about that, that, that phrase, picture book artist, um, uh, and my hesitancy about the term even illustrator. Um, uh, as you know, I'm the uh, curator of the Marie Sendak Foundation, and, and Marie Sendak was always very um, worried a little bit about the way in which the term illustrator sometimes was treated with oh, uh, disrespect in the history of the tw of 20th century. In fact, when I was an art student, often um, and then a teacher, too, uh, often in a, in a class or a crit, uh, one of the other teachers would say, oh, that picture is too much like an illustration, as if an illustration was a bad thing, an illustrating was a bad thing. There was a kind of prejudice at the height of modernism in the 20th century that works of art that were um, visual should not be also literary, and there was a prejudice against narrative, but as uh, Norman Rockwell liked to point out, the Sistine Ceiling is an illustration of the Bible, and um, I don't see any particular reason why a work of art that um, is in relationship to words should somehow be uh, worse than uh, an abstraction. So that said, um, you'll notice that on many of Marie Sendak's books it says pictures by, it doesn't call him an illustrator. And, but on the other hand, of course, um, there's nothing wrong with being an illustrator. Illustration is a noble profession, and that's the main point. So Edward Artizoni is as much an artist as Jackson Pollock is an artist and as Rembrandt is an artist. So we should always call him an artist first, but he also did marvelous illustrations, meaning that his pictures appeared in books near next to words. Um, and... Um, Anyway, he is a British um, artist who was born in 1900. He was actually born in Vietnam, uh, and then when he was five, his family moved um, to England. His mother was half Scottish and British. Um, his father had was working for a tele, telegram, telegraph company, international telegraph company. Anyway, they moved back to England, and Ardizoni grew up and lived most of all of his life and lived most of all of his life, I guess, in England. So we think of him as a, and is, a, a British um, illustrator and artist. Um, Artizoni is very well known for his Tim series of picture books for children. The first one he did in 1936, and it's called Tim and the Brave Sea Captain. And it's just wonderful. It's a wonderful kind of marvelous story. Um, of a, of a little boy who wants so much to be, um, who be befriends a sea captain and learns about the war of the sea um, from him, a kind of retired uh, captain who then it, it inspires him to sort of run away. He he has this amazing adventure on a on a, on a I guess a fishing boat, and eventually comes back to his parents. So it all works out in the well and of, well and it. And in a way, it's a kind of fantasy. And, and it's interesting because uh, Marie Sendak uh, loved Edward Ardizoni's work, and they, they actually became friends. They shared an editor. Judy Taylor was Edward Ardizoni's um, editor in England, and that was um, Marie Sendak's British editor. And they met in the 1960s, and they had a correspondence and wrote back, to, back and forth together. So they, so they know, knew each other, and, and Ardizoni is much earlier generation, definitely was an influence on, on Maurice Sendak's work, and they admired each other's, they admired each other's work. One thing that Edward Ardizoni did that um, Maurice Sendak always wanted to do, which is that he not only illustrated children's books, but he did a lot of illustration of, as we would say, grown-up books. 
in the in the 19th century, um, it was not just something that was sort of done. It was always done um, that novels and fiction would have illustrations. In fact, Henry James uh, didn't like that. He felt that only if he hadn't done a good job should there be uh, illustrations in his book. But nevertheless, they were felt that it was necessary. And of course, books like Trollope and Dickens were all all had um, illustrations. Um, but that has sort of gone by the board now. Um, but um, Artizoni is sort of in the middle of that, still part, really part of that uh, great British tradition. And he did drawings for Trollope. As a matter of fact, he also did drawings for things like Peter Pan and Don Quixote and uh, Graham Greene. So, and, and also he's a wonderful um, wartime sketch artist, illustrator. So he, he, and he actually published later a, a memoir of, of his drawings during um, World War II. Um, there's a really nice book on his work. I don't think it's in print anymore, but this is Gabriel White's book on Edward Ardizzoni that I got from eBay, and there are quite a lot. I saw there were quite a lot of copies that you can still get of this book. Um, I'll give you a very brief look through, um, keeping in mind, you know, that, that, you know, I don't want to break any copyrights here. And then another book, which I love, is a late book that Ardizzoni did, which is a memoir um, of his childhood into um, really how he sort of becomes an artist. So it sort of brings him into his 20s. And I love the way that it, it opens. Um, he talks about old memories, he says, are strange in the sense that one never can be sure how true they are. The most vivid of them are probably fairly accurate, even allowing for time and nostalgia to make the inevitable changes. Half and quarter memories are a different matter. What truth is there in them? Some may be quite fictitious, but believed in just the same. Often I would prefer to use instead of I remember the phrase I think of so-and-so as or of such and such as. And then he goes on to talk about some of those memories and how drawing um, in his mind, you know, conjuring them up and then drawing it, creates a kind of image of these memories, but he doesn't know how accurate they are. But nevertheless, that's what the book is going to be about. Now, one of the things you'll see in these, um, in, in Edward Artizoni's sketches, is, um, is how I think they look almost like they were done with a fountain pen ink, or how they could easily inspire um, someone to sketch with a fountain pen. Um, I spoke to um, one of his um, children, and they said, or emailed, we, we talked, we correspond on email, and they said that it's definitely true that um, Artisoni used a fountain pen, um, certainly to write with, certainly probably to do some sketching with, but his most famous drawings and his completing drawings were done with a dip pen, which is a pen that holds a removable nib and that you, as it says, you dip into the ink. Um, dip pens are, have a great deal of flexibility to them, but of course it's a kind of a pen you have to keep sticking them into the ink. And the other thing is if you're not careful, you leave a big blob of ink on your paper. So that's one of the reasons why it's so wonderful to use a fountain pen. But certainly, I think his style is easily translatable into um, a fountain pen, particularly those which are flexible. And so, um, um, you know, so I think he's a great one to look at his drawings to see the way they have a kind of journalistic quality, meaning they they seem always always to be sketchy, right? They have a kind of freedom and openness to them that uh, I think is very conducive to the idea of sketching, urban sketching, keeping a journal, doing memory drawings, all those things I think are quite marvelous. Um, he has amazing facility, but it's not like, oh my goodness, this is so impressive that you can't possibly do anything like it. It seems to say almost, no, this is, this is almost like writing. Um, this is something that anyone can do if they practice and keep, keep at it, right? Um, uh, and I, I love that kind of freedom to them. 
Um, he's very different. I mean, although both Maurice Sendak and um, Edward R. Dizzoni do cross-hatching, Edward Gorey is another cross-hatcher that comes to mind, um, uh, R. Dizzoni is never, you know, super um, tight, and his cross-hatching is has a kind of um, freedom to it, or um, uh, and very stylized in a way. And and he you know where where Sendak was all about doing different kinds of drawing for different kinds of work. Ardizoni's work always sort of looks similar, right? It it he he has a kind of look to the way he works and a way that he draws, and that's one way of being an artist. Um, while Sendak felt that it was his obligation as an illustrator to change constantly with different kinds of writing, where there are different, different approaches to the whole, whole pro, uh, project. I, I love Artizoni's work because, you know, it's so dedicated to the idea of drawing as a kind of response to life, to what's going on on a daily basis. And that, again, is why I love this, this autobiography um, and the way in which... Um, you know, it uses drawing as, as a kind of extension of memory in, uh, throughout it. So what am I going to do today at the end that has to do with pens? I'm going to be using this um, Esterbrook vintage pen, which is a pen that um, I could imagine Edward Ardizzoni owning and using, in fact. And then, uh, but the difference is that I put... Um, a special nib onto it that is actually a nib that is um, sold in England uh, by a company called Osmoroid. So it's possible that Edward uh, Ardizzoni could have used the very same kind of nib that I put onto this pen. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'll do a drawing, you know, a writing, kind of writing sample to show you how that nib works, this special hooded nib. And then I'm going to do a double emulation. I am working uh, in my art on um, illustrating Moses' Exodus. So I've been looking at a lot of illustrations of Exodus and paintings of Exodus. And one, one of the most famous is Poussin painting, the French artist Poussin um, did a painting of the uh, worship of the golden calf. And so I thought for some reason it would be fun to do a sketch of that painting in my uh, uh, tortured attempt to imitate Edward Ardizzoni's style, um, kind of the freedom of it, and, um, you know, use this pen to do that. So, as I say, it's a, a double emulation. Um, if you enjoyed this um, talk, um, uh, please uh, subscribe. That's the way to support all this work that I'm doing to make these, these videos, and it makes me happy. So please do subscribe and tell people, um, your friends, about um, these videos. Um, emulation, I'm going to be using the uh, Esterbrook J pen, which is a vintage pen, but a very usually very affordable. This is a very, very popular pen. It came in different colors and also different models. There's a smaller version, the SJ. There's a more narrow version um, of it, which I think is called the LJ. And they started making these in the late 40s and the 50s. And what's, I've, I've talked about this pen before, what's, what's wonderful about it is that you can put different nibs into it. So uh, a standard uh, nib for this pen looks like this. This is an Esterbrook nib, but there are literally dozens of these nibs that they made that you can get all kinds of different variations, um, and they are still available. I guess what they would call new old stock on eBay and different pen dealers sell these nibs and they're interchangeable. But um, the cool thing is that companies like Os uh, Osmeroid um, also um, made these nibs. And I have a very special hooded nib on this pen uh, that Osmeroid made, which they um, marketed as a sketch nib or 
this, uh, and, they, and you would you would put this on their sketch pen. They had um, these sets that, um, like this one, this is the Osmoro pen set, and there you can see I have another one of these hooded nibs, and these fit perfectly onto this pen. And um, and so that makes it, I think, really wonderful. Here's one of the pens that actually comes with an Osmoroid. This is, I think, marketed as the actual sketch pen. And I don't have the nib in it right now. But um, here you can see, here's one with a nib on it. And it's a piston filler. Um, I I like using, using the um, vintage uh, pen holder. Um, I mean, you know, this is not a bad pen either. They, it works perfectly fine. It's a bit light and there's nothing to write home about it. And I just sort of like putting it onto this, this beautiful vintage pen. And you can, you can pick up these vintage pens on eBay for around, oh my goodness, you sometimes get them $20. The thing is that they often have not been restored. So the sack in them dries out and it's relatively easy to replace the sack. But you have to buy a sack, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And I found there are certain people who are selling them restored for as cheaply as $30. Sometimes you see them $50, $60. I, I don't know. I would wait to find a good deal on it. Um, and, um, you know, that's one thing to do. Or if you want to get into the whole vintage pen restoration deal, this is probably the easiest pen to do that with. Um, so, um, you know, pick up one of the um, uh, ones that haven't been restored, but then you have to find a dealer who sells the sacks. you got to get a sack, and you have to get the different equipment, but it's a lot of fun to do it. And as I say, I've done it myself, and there are a lot of YouTube videos about how to do that. The, um, the hood of this nib actually makes it quite wet, and I think it, what it does is it brings more ink to the nib. It also kind of protects it when you use it to flex, to make thin and thick lines. You can see that it has this ability to be thin and thick. It's, it's very wet. It's a little scratchy, kind of scratchy, but it also is very bouncy. And I, I enjoy writing with it. I'm not writing with it, but drawing with it. It's not really great for writing. Um, and here I am drawing from the Poussin, a reproduction of the Poussin in pencil very quickly, not any of the facility of Edward Artizoni, but, and then he usually has in this autobiography one color that he applies, and then I wait till it dries, and then I put the ink over this very quickly, and hopefully expressively, and I'm not trying to copy the Poussin so much as give it sort of the sense of the overall composition and the life in it and get some of the energy that I see in Artizoni's work. Oh, don't forget to, to subscribe.